This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Michael Scherer. Typee by Herman Melville. Chapter 20 Nothing can be more uniform and undiversified than the life of the Typees. One tranquil day of ease and happiness follows another in quiet succession. And with these unsophisticated savages, the history of a day is the history of a life. I will therefore, as briefly as I can, describe one of our days in the valley. To begin with the morning. We were not very early risers. The sun would be shooting his golden spikes above the Hepar mountain, ere I threw aside my tapa robe, and girding my long tunic about my waist, sallied out with Fayaway and Kori Kori, and the rest of the household, and bent my steps towards the stream. Here we found congregated all those who dwelt in our section of the valley, and here we bathed with them. The fresh morning air and the cool flowing waters put both soul and body in a glow, and after a half hour employed in this recreation, we sauntered back to the house. Tinor and Marheyo gathering dry sticks by the way for firewood, some of the young men laying the coconut trees under contribution as they passed beneath them, while Kori Kori played his outlandish pranks for my particular diversion, and Feiwe and I, not arm in arm to be sure, but sometimes hand in hand, strolled along with feelings of perfect charity for all the world, and a special goodwill towards each other. Our morning meal was soon prepared. The islanders are somewhat abstemious at this repast, reserving the more powerful efforts of their appetite to a later period of the day. For my own part, with the assistance of my valet, who, as I have before stated, always officiated as spoon on these occasions, I ate sparingly from one of Tinor's trenchers of poey poey, which was devoted exclusively for my own use, being mixed with the milky meat of ripe coconut. A section of a roasted breadfruit, a small cake of amar, or a mess of koku, two or three bananas, or a mommy apple, an annui, or some other agreeable and nutritious fruit, served from day to day to diversify the meal, which was finished by tossing off the liquid contents of a young coconut or two. While partaking of this simple repast, the inmates of Marheyo's house, after the style of the indolent Romans, reclined in sociable groups upon the divan of mats and digestion was promoted by cheerful conversation. After the morning meal was concluded, pipes were lighted, and among them my own especial pipe, a present from the noble Mahavi. The islanders, who only smoke a whiff or two at a time, and at long intervals, and who keep their pipes going from hand to hand continually, regarded my systematic smoking of four or five pipefuls of tobacco in succession as something quite wonderful. When two or three pipes had circulated freely, the company gradually broke up. Marheyo went to the little hut he was forever building. Tinor began to inspect her rolls of tapa, or employed her busy fingers in plaiting grass mats. The girls anointed themselves with their fragrant oils, dressed their hair, or looked over their curious finery, and compared together their ivory trinkets, fashioned out of boar's tusks or whale's teeth. The young men and warriors produced their spears, paddles, canoe gear, battle clubs, and war conchs, and occupied themselves in carving all sorts of figures upon them with pointed bits of shell or flint, and adorning them, especially the war conchs, with tassels of braided bark and tufts of human hair. Some, immediately after eating, threw themselves once more upon the inviting mats, and resumed the employment of the previous night sleeping as soundly as if they had not closed their eyes for a week. Others sallied out into the groves, for the purpose of gathering fruit or fibers of bark and leaves, the last two being in constant requisition, and applied to a hundred uses. A few, perhaps, among the girls, would slip into the woods after flowers, or repair to the stream with small calabashes and coconut shells, in order to polish them by friction with a smooth stone in the water. In truth, these innocent people seemed to be at no loss for something to occupy their time, and it would be no light task to enumerate all their employments, or rather, pleasures. 
My own mornings I spent in a variety of ways. Sometimes I rambled about from house to house, sure of receiving a cordial welcome wherever I went, or from grove to grove, and from one shady place to another, in company with Cory Cory and Fayaway, and a rabble rout of merry young idlers. Sometimes I was too indolent for exercise, and accepting one of the many invitations I was continually receiving, stretched myself out on the mats of some hospitable dwelling, and occupied myself pleasantly, either in watching the proceedings of those around me, or taking part in them myself. Whenever I chose to do the latter, the delight of the islanders was boundless, and there was always a throng of competitors for the honor of instructing me in any particular craft. I soon became quite an accomplished hand at making tapa, could braid a grass sling as well as the best of them, and once, with my knife, carved the handle of a javelin so exquisitely that I have no doubt to this day Carnunu, its owner, preserves it as a surprising specimen of my skill. As noon approached, all those who had wandered forth from our habitation began to return, and when midday was fairly come, scarcely a sound was to be heard in the valley. A deep sleep fell upon all. The luxurious siesta was hardly ever omitted except by old Marheyo, who was so eccentric a character that he seemed to be governed by no fixed principles whatever, but acting just according to the humor of the moment, slept, ate, or tinkered away at his little hut, without regard to the proprieties of time or place. Frequently he might have been seen taking a nap in the sun at noonday, or a bath in the stream at midnight. Once I beheld him perched eighty feet from the ground, in the tuft of a coconut tree, smoking, and often I saw him standing up to the waist in water, engaged in plucking out the stray hairs of his beard, using a piece of mussel shell for tweezers. The noontide slumber lasted generally an hour and a half, very often longer, and after the sleepers had arisen from their mats, they again had recourse to their pipes, and then made preparations for the most important meal of the day. I, however, like those gentlemen of leisure who breakfast at home and dine at their club, almost invariably during my intervals of health, enjoyed the afternoon repast with the bachelor chiefs of the tea, who were always rejoiced to see me, and lavishly spread before me all the good things which their larder afforded. Mahavy generally produced among other dainties a baked pig, an article which I have every reason to suppose was provided for my sole gratification. The tea was a right jovial place. It did my heart, as well as my body, good to visit it. Secure from female intrusion, there was no restraint upon the hilarity of the warriors, who, like the gentlemen of Europe after the cloth is drawn and the ladies retire, freely indulged their mirth. After spending a considerable portion of the afternoon at the tea, I usually found myself, as the cool of the evening came on, either sailing on the little lake with Fayaway, or bathing in the waters of the stream with a number of the savages, who at this hour always repaired thither. As the shadows of night approached, Marheyo's household were once more assembled under his roof. Tapers were lit, long and curious chants were raised, interminable stories were told, for which one present was little the wiser, and all sorts of social festivities served to while away the time. The young girls very often danced by moonlight in front of their dwellings. There are a great variety of these dances, in which, however, I never saw the men take part. They all consist of active, romping, mischievous evolutions, in which every limb is brought into requisition. Indeed, the Marquesan girls dance all over, as it were. Not only do their feet dance, but their arms, hands, fingers, ay, their very eyes, seem to dance in their heads. In good sooth, they so sway their floating forms, arch their necks, toss aloft their naked arms, and glide and swim and whirl, that it was almost too much for a quiet, sober-minded, modest young man like myself. The damsels wear nothing but flowers and their compendious gala tunics, and when they plume themselves for the dance, they look like a band of olive-colored sylphides on the point of taking wing. Unless some particular festivity was going forward, the inmates of Marheyo's house retired to their mats rather early in the evening, 
but not for the night, since, after slumbering lightly for a while, they rose again, relit their tapers, partook of the third and last meal of the day, at which Poey Poey alone was eaten, and then, after inhaling a narcotic whiff from a pipe of tobacco, disposed themselves for the great business of night, sleep. With the Marquesans it might almost be styled the great business of life, for they pass a large portion of their time in the arms of Somnus. The native strength of their constitutions is no way shown more emphatically than in the quantity of sleep they can endure. To many of them, indeed, life is little else than an often interrupted and luxurious nap.